I really appreciate the fact that we have men that are willing and able. See, to be willing is one thing, but you have to also be able. Amen. Some people are willing, but they don't have the ability. Some people have the ability, but they're unwilling. And we thank God that we have men, especially Commander Charles. I have just watched this program just blossom uh, with him leading it. And you know what? He's a military man, and, and you, you know, we don't know how long we have our military people, so we better learn to appreciate them while we're here. Amen. Now, it's my goal to get military people to come here and retire and live here forever. Amen. But we don't, we don't know what the, what the government's going to do, and we don't know when jobs will change. So uh, I just want him to know, his family to know that, that we appreciate them. God is good. Amen. All right. Well, today I'm going to be preaching to you. I love Lakeside. I'm going to do my best to keep it within a respectable time. But I want to talk to you about a concept. And this concept is J1L4. Everybody say J1L4. J1L4. Now, see, there is a thing that the University of Louisville does. And if you're not a University of Louisville fan, I'm sorry. I am. I know they lost to Florida State, but, you know, whatever. But they have a thing called L1C4, and it means Louisville first, Cardinals forever. And basically what it is, is a brand that they've decided to make their school represent. They say, we want to recruit student athletes that put Louisville first. It's not about the name on the back of the jersey. It's not about their future goals. It's not about the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, or anything else. It is about being a member of the University of Louisville Cardinals and taking pride in that. Then the second thing they emphasize is once you, become to U, once you come to L, you're a Cardinal forever. You represent us for life. So once you graduate, if you start acting a fool, then you are hindering and hurting the cause of the University of Louisville. If you go and you represent well and you do things right, then you're a good representative of the University of Louisville. And I think that is a good model to use for God's church. J1L4 simply to me means Jesus first, Lakeside forever. And you may say, well, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, let me explain. First, I would say every one of you in this room today say you love Jesus. Amen? Boy, there should have been some convincing amens. I said everyone in this room today says you love Jesus. Amen? So if you say you love Jesus, then I must submit to you that you must love Lakeside. Because Lakeside is his church. Why? Why can I say that with such confidence? Well, because Jesus loves Lakeside. You know how I can know that Jesus loves Lakeside? In Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands. And you're like, what? Stay with me. Like, brother's already getting in trouble. Meddling instead of preaching, just stay with me. Because Paul is talking about something very key here. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives must also submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Here's the point. Just as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself a radiant church without wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but feeds it and cares for it just as Christ does the church. We are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And listen to what Paul says. He says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and his church. So he's saying, look, I'm not necessarily only talking about marriage here. I'm talking about Christ and his church being in comparison to marriage. Number one, Jesus loves the church. He gave his life for it so that it could be presented to him blameless, spotless, without wrinkle or blemish. He loved the church so much that he died for it. So see, Jesus loves the church. And it says if he loves the church, he feeds it and cares for it because we are members of his body. So here's the thing. Jesus is the head, it says, of the body. Right? Right? And he cares for it and feeds it. So that means he's the boss. He's in charge. He's the director. But it's not just that. He loves it. He gave his life for it. So if we love Jesus, we love the church. You cannot say, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. 
that is an oxymoron. It's impossible. It is impossible to say, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. Now, there may be some foolish things that the church has done throughout history, but I love the church. I love the local church. I love Jesus first, and I love Lakeside. And I will tell you, if I have it my way, I will pastor this church until the day I retire. Amen? But if I have it my way, you will all be part of this church until the day you die. Amen? Because that's what it takes to build a church. It takes people who are willing to stay. And when I retire, I don't intend to move. I intend to assist whatever pastor takes over. Amen? So the good news is, y'all stuck with me a long time because I'm pretty young. And I plan on living a long time. Ernest T. Bass said it best, I may be mean, but I make up for it by being healthy. (laughs) Jesus loves the local church. He left us here to accomplish a local mission to local people. Amen? Amen. Do you realize that Hardin County needs Lakeside Worship Center? Just like it needs every other church in this community? They need us to love Lakeside. Just as much as Jesus does. To the point that we're willing to give our lives. Maybe not in death, but maybe to give our lives while we live. And see, I'm looking to build something special. I'm looking to build something that's lasting. I'm looking to build something that's eternal. But you cannot say, I love Jesus, but I do not love my church. If you love Jesus, you're part of his body, which is the church. If you love Jesus, you can't say, I don't need the church. 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 21, says, The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. I don't have time to break down these texts today. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So there should be no division in the body. But each part should have equal concern for each other. In other words, there's some parts that are more glamorous. There's some parts that are less noticeable. There's some parts we try to hide, and there's some parts we try to show. And ultimately, all those parts work together to accomplish one mission, and that is to lift up the name of Jesus. To lift up and honor the one who gave his life for us that we could be without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Jesus died for our sin. Jesus got up from the grave. Jesus sent the Holy Ghost as a deposit so that we could become his church. And when we love him, we will love his church. And it goes on and it says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. You know, we got some parts that are suffering today. We got a brother here that's, that's facing surgery. We got a brother here that lost his dad one year ago today. We have a sister here that lost her husband just about a year ago today. Um, there are all over the place people that are suffering and struggling and we should feel compassion for each other and we should understand that, hey, you know what? We need each other. We need the body functioning and working. Um, just imagine if your emotions just quit on you and said, I don't need you anymore. I'm not part of the body anymore. What if your mind just decided to take the day off, which some, you wonder if that's what happens. We need each other. It says the church has appointed, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking with different kinds of tongues. So he's talking about the fact that there are all kinds of different people who have different gifts, and it goes on later and says, do all speak in tongues? What if we all did the same thing? What if the whole body was an eye? What if the whole body was a mouth? And some of you, you make me wonder if that's not the case. Now, I wasn't talking about you, but that's a great laugh. Um, See, here's the thing. I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, I love Lakeside. And because I love Jesus and I love Lakeside, I want to commit to this place for the rest of my life. And I want a team of people that are willing to make that same commitment that I want to commit to this mission for the rest of my life. And you know what? God alters plans, right? 
Sometimes he gets all up in the middle of your business, because his business, and he throws a monkey wrench in your plans, and hey, I'm not, you know what? Not going to judge that. That's, that's God's responsibility. But what if while we're here, we make a lifelong commitment and say, you know, because if you make a lifelong commitment, that means today you're engaged, and tomorrow you're engaged, and the next day. Here's a funny thing. Danny told me the attendance today. We have about 180 people here today. Um, we average about 160 on any given week. How many people do you think call Lakeside Worship Center their home church and come here with fair regularity? Somebody give me a guess. I'm talking about they come here once a month or more. How many people do you think that is? About 235. And our average attendance is 160. So what does that tell you? There's about 75 to 80 people out every week for various reasons. And a lot of times those reasons are valid, but I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot more times those reasons are not valid. There's a lot of times those reasons are just excuses, which we're going to get to here in just a minute. There are very valid reasons. If you're throwing your guts up, but don't, don't come around here spreading your germs. If you're on vacation, you know, and, and I, I don't understand folks that take 26 vacations a year. But, uh, you know, if you're on vacation, God bless you. Enjoy your vacation. But when you're here, be here. Amen? Amen. And see, we, uh, uh, the staff and I, we joke about when people miss church. We say, you know, everyone has two or three times a year where they miss for valid reasons. They're good reasons to miss. But sometimes they will use up those good reasons for bad reasons and still want to use their good reasons, which doubles the time they miss, plus their sickness and different things that go on, right? And then you end up out for a month. And then you're out of fellowship, and it's hard to get back in. So if you love Lakeside, there are four things I really want to get to quickly that I believe you will do. You will be faithful to attend church. Hebrews 24, 25 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward good, for love and good deeds. You know why we come together? It's to spur each other on toward love and good deeds, to encourage each other, to put a fire in each other, to get each other excited about the mission that God has called us to. And it says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see that day approaching. See, I am looking to build something special, as I've already said. I want Lakeside to be a lighthouse in this community that people will see shining brightly, and they want to come and see what it is. And you know what I want them to come see what it is? A place that is filled with people that love Jesus and love Lakeside, that are excited to be here. Do you know why I enjoyed our event on Friday so much? It's because the team of people that came to volunteer were excited to be here. They wanted to be part of it. And when they saw our guests coming, they were excited to welcome them. They were excited to pull them in and care for them and show them the love of God and feed them and serve them. And I thought, man, that's the environment I want every time we open the doors. People that are stoked to be here. And sometimes it's hard to get stoked to do what we perceive as the same thing every week, isn't it? But see, the thing is, if we commit to that level, to where we say, J1L4, Jesus first, Lakeside forever. We get to the point where we say, I love Jesus so much that I love my church because I'm going to tell you something. I go home to the same woman every single day and I intend to do that depending on whoever lives the longest. If I had it my way, we'd live well in years, healthy, still filled with fire and passion and we'd go out like notebook. Lay in the bed and give up the ghost together. Not have to live a day without each other. But I don't go home and think, you look the same as you did yesterday. We had spaghetti last week. We always have tacos, usually on Tuesday or Thursday. I can't remember which one it is. And I don't think, this is boring. Because I love her. And when I have that love relationship with her, it makes everything awesome. It makes tacos good. It makes spaghetti wonderful. It makes laying around watching goofy movies awesome. It makes Mima taking the grandbabies away. Hoo-hoo! <laughs> Thank you, Mima. But if I love my wife, I'm going to be a faithful to attend my house. 
I ain't going to say, well, baby, I've had a rough day, so I ain't coming home. Oh, honey, it's my only day to sleep in, so I ain't coming home tonight. I got a pack for my trip next week, honey. I ain't coming home tonight. You hurt my feelings, baby. I ain't coming home tonight. Honey, the couch is too hard. I ain't coming home tonight. Honey, it takes you too long to tell me anything. I ain't coming home tonight. All these things we say. Well, I love my church. And I see y'all. Y'all prove y'all love your church by tagging us on Facebook. In my church. It's like, where you been? I don't even recognize you. We have about 230 plus people that attend here regularly, and we average 70 less than that. And I'm not here to beat anybody down. I'm just here to say, man, if you love Jesus, you're going to love your church. And if you love your church, you're going to break down any barrier to get there. You know, we have people here today that are not feeling good. Just press through. Suck it up. And, and now, there's different levels of not feeling good. Don't get me wrong, right? There is, you know, I've just, I've, I've had a rough week, and I've been sick, and I'm recovering. And then there's, you know, I'm dying, throwing up. Don't come to church and have to bring a bucket. Take, take care of yourself. Don't be foolish. But folks, we make too many excuses sometimes. Can I ask you a question? How can we get on the same page as a church if we have different people showing up every week? Do we really believe the mission God has given us? Are we really committed to love Jesus? Not because we feel obligated or guilty. You know how bad it would stink if I went home every day just because I felt guilty? Oh, I'd have married this woman. I guess I better go home. Good grief. Here we go again. Pull in the driveway. It's like, oh, Jesus. She's going to be at the door. She's probably going to want to kiss. Ugh. Obligatory kiss. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now let me go to the... Right? This stupid hard couch. These hard pews. Same old dinner every week. Oh, now I've got to go to bed and lay next to this woman. Goodness. Oh, what time is it? Oh, gosh. Can I, can I get up early tomorrow? How miserable would that be? And isn't that how some of us view church? And Jesus loves the church, and we say we love Jesus. And we should love his people. It should be exciting when we get up in the morning on Sunday and observe the Lord's day. Let's talk about that in just a minute. Why do we meet on Sundays? Why is it important to meet every week? Because it's a pattern established by the apostles. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1 through 3, it says, Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatians church to do. On the first day of every week, each of you should set aside a sum of money and keep with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So Paul, they took offerings on the first day of the week. What a concept. Wonder why we do that. They met together on the first day of the week. What a concept. I wonder why we do that. We do it because that's the pattern established by the Bible. In Revelation 1.10, it says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. John received the prophecy of the book of Revelation on the Lord's day, the first day of the week. And see, throughout history, that has been a day set aside for the Lord. It belonged to Him, and we were only to do things that pertained to Him on that day. And something happened in our country. Because back in the 1800s all the way until the 1960s, hardly anything was open on Sunday. Because it was the Lord's Day. They recognized this is a day set aside for God. This is a day to do things of God. But see, now culture has shifted where we no longer observe the Lord's Day. And now everything moves on every day as if God doesn't even matter. And the church has got swallowed in that vacuum. And now we're to the place that we're so distracted and we're so all over the place because we got a hundred different things we need to do. So I got to go shopping. There's probably some of us in here that need to go to Walmart today. And well, you know, I got the pot roast on. Oh, man, I forgot the seasoning. So I got to go get the seasoning. And well, I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to do this. And well, the lawn needs mowing and the grass needs cutting. And that's the same thing I know, but I'm just, I'm just winging it here, okay? All these different things need to happen, and well, it's my only day off anymore, and it's the only day I can get all these things, it's the only day I can sleep in, it's the only day I can do all this, I can do it, only day, only day, only day, and, and it's like, we have let every other day get so swallowed up by the cares of this life that the Lord's day really isn't the Lord's day anymore. It's just the day that if we feel like it, we take a couple hours and give Him His token. What a shame that we've let culture absolutely 
back us into a corner. To a place to where Sunday is just any other day. And I pray we can take it back. I pray we can take this culture back. I don't see how. We are so swallowed by this thing, I don't see how. But if we love Jesus, we're going to set aside some time and say, this is your time, Lord. This is the time I'm giving to you, God. And historically, that time has been Sunday. So the second thing you're going to do besides attend, be faithful to the church, is you're going to give. Oh, Lord, here we go again. And he's going to Malachi 3, I bet. You're right. Start with verse 8. Will a man rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you're under a curse. The whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and there will be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you will not have room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Now, real quickly, back to the Lord's day before we move into this. If you don't give the Lord one day a week, I guarantee you your life is chaos. Guarantee it. If there is not one day a week that you set aside and say, God, this day belongs to you, your life's a mess. You can't see which end is up. You're probably going crazy. And you're blaming everything else. And sometimes you probably even blame the church because they're demanding more of your time. But don't blame Jesus because you can't manage your life. Amen? And I don't know how to fix it. I'll be honest, I don't know how to fix it. The world is spinning out of control and we seem to be following right along with it. But, but, the, but the early church set a pattern. And actually, they had to do two weeks, or two days, because they also met in the Sabbath. They went to the temples and synagogues and preached. That's why the church had to be shifted to Sunday. Because on Saturday, they were ministering to the Jews. On Sunday, they were ministering to the Gentile church. So if your life, if you can't seem to get a hold of your time, if it seems like time's always slipping away from you and you can't never seem to get everything done, there's a real good chance that you don't have a day set aside to the Lord. And I would, I would encourage you that the most natural day is the day that the apostles set, Sunday. Figure out a way to make Sunday God's day. And I know it's hard to get worked out with work schedules, but see, I'm of the mind that if we honor God, God will back us. Amen? And maybe we can reason with our bosses. Maybe we can't, but the thing is, when you can, work it out. When you can't, pray it out. God will defend you. He will help you. Amen? So the second thing you will do besides attend is you will give. See, here's the facts. See, these nice seats you're sitting on that are, that are nice and soft and not hard like pews. Um, this nice building. All these ministry activities that we do, Rover the, Rover the Dog, Faith the Cat, and all, all these different things. So they cost this stuff called money. And when you have a church this size, a building this size, our utility bill alone in the winter is over $2,000. I mean, we can turn the electricity off and save a lot of money, but then we wouldn't be able to pay the mortgage because nobody would come, which is about $5,000. I mean, I'm almost to 10 grand, and I ain't even told you about anything that we do. We have staff that works for virtually nothing just, just so we can pay our bills and get by because we want to keep the ministry funds as free as possible. In order to do those things, it takes giving. And I, 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 I'm going to say I love talking about this. I used to say I hate talking about it, but I'm going to say I love talking about it because it is the way for God to bless you. It says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and vines in your fields. See, here's the thing. If you don't give to the things of God, I can tell you right now, just like if you don't give your time to God your, 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 or don't give a day to God, your life and your time is a wreck. If you don't give to God what belongs to Him, I guarantee you your finances are a wreck. I guarantee you that you can't get your finances order. You can't figure out why it is you can't pay your bills. You can't figure out why it is that everything keeps happening that saps you and sucks your money away from you. Why do these things keep happening to me? How come I can't never seem to get ahead up? How come these people that make half the, of me, half that I make, seem to have it all together, but yet my finances are always in a wreck? It's because you don't give God what belongs to Him. Just like if you don't give God His day, your time's going to be in chaos. You're never going to seem to have enough time. If you don't go give God His portion in your finances, your finances are always going to be crazy, wrecked, messed up. 
He only asks for a small portion. Here's the great thing about that small portion. Everyone can give 10%. Rich, poor alike. The, le the less you make, the less you give. The more you make, the more you give. It's the ultimate plan. Nobody has to do anything beyond their ability. And if we were to be honest, most of us blow more than 10% of our money on foolish, frivolous, meaningless things that will get us nothing and end up wasting away. But I firmly believe, I have never been a rich man my entire life. But I've always had everything I need. And I firmly believe it's because I'm a tither. And I give in offerings, and I bless the Lord with everything that I'm able to do. I have talked about this at length in a series. If you want to know more about this, I'd be glad to get that to you. But I'm not going to beat the subject to death. But here's the fact. If you want this church to function as God's called it to function, and you want all the things that we do on a weekly basis, and if you want to have full-time staff who's here and dedicated, ready to serve you at any time, 24 hours a day, especially multiple staff. We have two full-time pastors here right now on this day that are able to drop whatever and help you out. I mean, if we want those things, it costs money. That's just a fact. If I could figure out a way to live for free, I'd do it. Amen? And the, the, the option the government offers, I'm unwilling to take your money and sit at home and do nothing and collect welfare. That's for sure. Amen? So I'm going to work, and I'm going to do my best to do my part. Third thing you will do if you love Lakeside, or if you love Jesus, and you love Lakeside, is you will serve. You will get involved. We're going to talk about this at length in a couple of weeks. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service. Two dirty words there. Work and serve. So the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. You realize you cannot become mature. You cannot become what God's called you to be. You cannot grow until you begin to serve. So just like if you don't give your time, if you don't set aside one day for God, I guarantee you your time's a wreck. You never have enough time. You're always frazzled. You're always frustrated. If you don't give God his portion, 10%, I guarantee your finances are a wreck. Your finances are frustrated. You can't seem to make ends meet. And if you don't serve, I guarantee you're spiritually frustrated. Your growth is stunted and you're thinking, man, church is boring. Pastor, you just don't feed me. I'm not getting fed. Well, get your butt out of the chair and do something. You might find some food. Amen? It's time for God's people to stand up and serve. If you say, I love Jesus, and you love Lakeside, then you need to do something. Amen? We've got a lot of people in the boat. We've got a lot of people rowing, but we've got a whole lot more just sitting. What would happen if everybody rowed? What would happen if half the people rowed and said, we'll wait till you get tired? And then when you're tired, we'll take the oars, and you rest a little bit. Some of our leaders are saying, Lord, that'd be awesome. Going on, it says, then we will no longer be infants. So if you don't serve, you're a baby. Always eating, never feeding. I am reading the word. Tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by cunningness and craftiness of men, deceitful scheming. If you're not serving your church, you're probably confused. Well, I just don't know which, which doctrine to follow. I don't know what's true, and I don't know about this. And you get in and serve, and God will help you with those things. Instead of speaking the truth in love, we want all things grow up to him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. See, here's the thing. If every part of the body doesn't work, then some other parts have to overcompensate. And what does that cause? Causes injury. Why do you think the body of Christ is so beat down and struggling? It's because too few people are doing too much and too many people are doing too little. Um, the Bible, or not the Bible, I'm sorry. Um, leadership tells us, leadership principles tells us that 80% of the people do 20% of the work and 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It's called the 80-20 principle. Which basically means there's a whole lot of people in the boat doing the least. If this is your church, 
This is where God's called you. Number one, you're going to be faithful to be here. Thing is, we should average over 200 people. We should have plenty of finances. And we should have people that can take extended times off and just soak it in because everybody's serving. We should have so many workers that we never have to beg for help in the nursery. We should have so many workers that we shouldn't have to beg for help in any area. Now, I'll tell you what, we have two areas, I thank God, that are, that are extremely well staffed. Our food bank is rocking, and our worship team, as you can see, has a lot of help. Huh? Yes, two good drummers this morning, and then our other good drummer is on a recruiting trip. So we thank God for that, but there, see, th- those areas... We thank God they're filled, but there are so many other needs in this church. Um, our, our youth need help. If, if they're 18 and under, they need help. Amen? It's an area we struggle to staff. Uh, I would love to have somebody volunteer to work in the office every day just to answer phones. And uh, we miss so many phone calls because we can't keep up, and that's not a need I've really expressed. But, you know, there's little things that can be done here that could really help us to become what God's called us to be. But here's my question. Can you say, I love Lakeside and it's my church if you refuse to get involved? And here's another question I just want you to consider. Can you really say, I love Jesus, if you refuse to get involved in his church? Can you really say that? Last thought. If you love Jesus and you love Lakeside, this is always the hardest one for me. You will support and respect the leadership. I was hoping to hear an amen there. I can't even beg for one. Will you say amen, Beth? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I was, I was wondering if anybody was going to help me here. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. Hebrews 13, 17. It says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be no advantage to you. Can I tell you something? Leadership, church leadership, especially the ministry of senior pastor, carries a tremendous burden just because it exists in a world that is hostile to the faith. It is our job to direct the affairs of the church to include telling you the truth, not what you want to hear. And sometimes you don't want to hear the church. As a matter of fact, a man, I can't remember his name, said, the further society drifts from the truth, the more they will hate those who share it. And the fact is, it is a burden and a difficult thing just sometimes to tell you the truth because I know it's painful. That's why it's said in our text, speaking the truth in love in Ephesians 4. It's hard to speak the truth. Sometimes it's hard to tell folks when they're in error. You know how much harder it is when people aren't cooperating? You know how much harder it is when people are rolling their eyes when you're preaching or when the doors are flapping? It's like a stinking fan is going on this morning. Those fans are, those doors are so busy. And you know how distracting that is? You're trying to preach and you're trying to leave and you see the doors just constantly going. And maybe I'm sharing a little frustration, but, but you know, I don't feel like I have to sit on my feelings all the time. Sometimes I can share my heart and share the things that bother me. Amen? We've castrated our preachers to the point to where they can't even have any feelings. Tell me what I want to hear. Keep a smile on that face. And don't you offend me. And I might come back next week. That's the pressure that's on us, and I'm not going to live under that pressure. I'm going to share what God gives me, and I'm going to do my best. I love you all. I love you all. I really do, and I love you all too much to play around. I love Jesus, and I love Lakeside. I'm committed to the mission that God's given this church, and sometimes it requires me to say and do some hard things. But when the leadership of this church doesn't sense your support and respect, do you know it's discouraging? You realize sometimes we lay our heads down at night wondering, does anybody have my back? Sometimes we wake up in the morning wondering, do I have any support? And the enemy tries to play on our emotions, doesn't he? Anybody ever been there? The enemy's tricky. He tries to play on my emotions. And I'm sure some of you can identify with this too. You wake up in the morning wondering, 
You know, does my church even care about me today? Does my church even notice that I'm struggling today? And we live in a society that's moving so fast. Number one, I think it's because we don't give God his day. We don't have time to pay attention anymore. We don't have time to notice. You notice Jesus noticed people that others overlooked. He noticed the children when the disciples were trying to push him away. He noticed the woman with the issue of blood when everybody said, she's in the way. We're too busy. And Jesus is like, this is why I'm here. If you're too busy to do what God's called you to do, something has got to change in your life. Amen? Something has got to change in your life. Can you really say you love Jesus if you won't support, respect, and submit to the leaders he's given you as a gift? And uh, it's hard to say because I'm the primary leader of this church. So I'm basically saying submit to me. And that sounds kind of challenging, doesn't it? But Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So when I quit following Jesus, you have permission to quit following me. As long as my eyes are on Jesus, then you have no reason not to follow. As long as I am preaching the word and as long as I am encouraging you toward righteousness, there is no reason for it not to be easy to follow. And I make it my mission. You know, I'm a lot of things, folks. I got a lot of weaknesses. I'll share a couple of them with you. I have a hard time keeping eye contact. Sometimes people talk to me and they want to get intimate in their conversation and my eyes want to dart. It's just a weakness that I have. It's a struggle. It's a battle. I have to force myself and say, Tim, look them in the eyes. 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 It's a struggle. And I guarantee you some of you have said, yeah, I've noticed. I could blame it on ADHD. I could give you a list of excuses, but it doesn't matter. Excuses are for babies. It's an, it's an angle in my life I'm working on. I have a hard time giving my undivided attention, especially when I'm busy. It's just something I struggle with. My mind is going 900 different directions 100% of the time. And then a person comes in unannounced and wants my time, and I don't have it. Can I tell you who broke me of that? Brother Campbell. Brother Campbell comes in my office and sits on that couch regardless of what I'm doing. I can be in the middle of prayer and sermon. I can be in the middle of whatever. He comes in and he sits down. And he's like, you know what? We're going to talk. <laughs> so there comes a point where I sit everything down and say, how are you doing today, Brother Campbell? We'll sit and talk for 15 minutes. And when he leaves, I'm so glad I did it. I'm like, man, how dare me be so busy that a member of this congregation comes and just wants to sit for a few minutes and talk? No, I could see that getting out of control and we would have to manage it eventually. I mean, if every one of y'all were to stream in, I mean, I don't get anything done. But it's taught me. People are important and it's okay to break away from what you're doing for just a moment and have a conversation with a World War II veteran that's got some stories to tell me. It's a struggle for me. Another weakness that I have is, is I, I have a tendency to kind of be standoffish. Somebody comes to me, I'm immediately measuring you. What do you want? How am I going to be here? And if, you, if, if it's your first Sunday and you're all over me like flies on honey talking about how great I am, I am already thinking there's something up with this guy. What do you want? It's a weakness that I'm working on. It's one of those areas of my life that I'm trying to improve. But see, here's the thing. I have some strengths as well. I believe I'm sincere. I believe I'm a person that sometimes wears my heart on my sleeve. And I can get my feelings hurt, but it's because I'm sincere. It's because I sincerely care about you all. I work hard, folks. I give my time, my effort, everything that I have. I work hard. I work, I work, I will work endlessly if that's what it takes. It's like I have a good work ethic. And, and I could go on about my own set of strengths as well. But here's what I believe. I believe as the pastor, I have earned your support, your respect, and I've earned the right to be followed. Amen? That's all I'm asking. I'm going to ask you to call me God. I'm going to ask you to put me on a pedestal. 
I'm not asking you to say I'm anything special. I'm just asking you to call me a man worth following. Amen? And call the team of leaders that give freely, most of them voluntarily. In fact, this week we honored several of our volunteers. We honor Tammy Joyner, who leads our impact ministries, and LaVonda Weedman, who leads our nursery, the most difficult area to staff, James and Sherry Keith, who leads our worship, Tim Jones, who leads our college and career ministry, Ann Summers and Rick Ogletree, who help us with the women and men's ministry, the Pace family, who helps us keep the church clean, and today we honored Charles Joyner, who leads our Royal Rangers. We'll be honoring people for the next several days that volunteer and give their time. And folks, they're people worth following. Could I get some music? It'll help me to end. But before you start playing, I want to play some special music for you all. No, you all come on up so you'll be ready when this is over. I want you all to hear this song and then I'll talk about it. some old friend, or just to stay home and kind of relax and hope some of the kin folks will start dropping in. Well, the church benches are too hard, and that choir sings way too loud. Boy, you know how nervous you get when you're sitting in a great big crowd. The doctor told you now you better watch them crowd. They'll set you back. But you go to that old ball game because you say it helps you to relax. Well, a headache Sunday morning and a backache Sunday night. But by work time Monday morning, you're feeling quite all right. While one of the children has a cold, pneumonia, do you suppose? That's part. Why the whole family had to stay home. Just to blow that poor kid's nose. Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. Now the devil is alive and him church you stay away. When people come to go the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church. Well, the preacher, he's too young, and maybe he's too old. The sermons, they're not hard enough, and maybe they're too bold. His voice is much too quiet, like sometimes it gets too loud. He needs to have more dignity, or else he's way too proud. Well, the sermons, they're too long, guilty, and maybe they're too short. He ought to preach the word with dignity instead of stomp and snort. Well, that preacher we've got must be the world's most stuck-up man. Well, one of the ladies told me the other day... Well, he didn't even shake my hand! Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. Now the devil, he'll supply them if the church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. It's kind of a humor to address. You know, because every time we say, I love Jesus and I love Lakeside, well, I can't attend because. You wouldn't believe some of the silly excuses I've heard. I had somebody call me on Thursday and say, I won't be at church on Sunday because I'm sick. I was like, well, let's, let's believe maybe God can get you a little better by Sunday. You got a few days to recoup. Don't prophesy your death. My favorite one, my favorite one, pastor, I got a pack for a trip. Oh, when's your trip? Tuesday. Well, it's my only day to sleep in. It's my only day to get blank done. Everybody has an excuse to give. Well, I've got a family member that's down and out. 
or, or not to give. I got a family member's down now. Well, I got to get my car fixed. I got to do this. My bills are just way too big and this and that. Excuses why I can't serve. I don't like kids. <laughs> Some of y'all saying that ain't an excuse. That's a reason. Excuses as to why you can't support the pastor. Preach too long. Preach too short. Talks too loud. Talks too quiet. Too young. Too old. I've heard all of them. Pastor, you need to learn to land that plane a little sooner. I'm a good impersonator. Here's what Jesus said. Luke chapter 14, verse 16. A certain man was preparing for a banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. And they all began alike to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. The other said, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I gotta go try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master. The owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant to go quickly out in the streets and alleys and of the town, bringing the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So the servant said, what your order has been done, but there's still room. The master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. And it was mean and is not one of those who made excuses. See, Jesus is a no-excuses kind of guy. In fact, in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, it says, They were walking along the road. A man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. You know, Jesus probably heard I love you so many times. I'll follow you so many times. He said, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, But first, let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That may sound pretty incompassionate, but most people believe that the man's father was not dead yet and that the man's father wasn't even sick. He was saying, look, let me go wait for my dad to die and then I'll come. Another one said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hands on the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Jesus recognized these are just people trying to make excuses. Jesus saying, follow me. Like, well, Lord, I would follow you, but I got this going on in my life. I got this issue and that issue, and I've got this going on and that going on. Lord, you know, I, I love you and all, and I believe you're my Savior, and you're a really good fella. I just got some stuff I need to do. Last time I saw everybody stand. Jesus loves Lakeside. Amen? And if you love him, you will too. So I'm asking these four things from you. And if everyone here today will do these four things, and then we kind of hit this all month, because we're going to hit the same theme all month, and we get everybody that comes all month on the same page, what could we become? Be faithful to attend. Be here. We need you here. Some of you say, well, you don't even notice when I'm gone. Can I tell you why it's so hard for me to notice who's gone? I'll be honest. We have a core of about 120 people here that I notice when they're gone. The rest of you are so in and out each week, I can't tell. It's hard to keep up. Be faithful to give. Get involved and follow me and the leadership as we follow Jesus. We have good leaders here. One thing I encourage you to do is after church today, just put a hashtag on either your Instagram, your Twitter page, or your Facebook, and just hashtag J1L4, and just see what kind of, a, of a, see what kind of questions you get. J1L4. Get it trending. Everybody follow me today. Can I tell you what? This church is a leader in this community. It's worth following. 
Maybe there's some of you this morning and you would just say, I'm struggling with my relationship with Jesus. You may say, I have issues in my life that I feel like are separating me from him. Can I tell you, as Pastor Ryan said this morning, that Jesus absolutely loves you regardless of condition. He doesn't look at you and say, well, if you just clean a few things up, I might be able to. He loves you just the way you sit. He loves you even if you don't love him. He loves you even if you don't love his church. And he wants to put a new heart and a new spirit inside of you. And if you just say, you know what, I'm struggling in my relationship with Jesus. Can you lift up a hand? Let's let me pray for you right where you stand. Yes, anybody else? I'm struggling in my relationship with Jesus. Anybody else? I see a couple. Yes. Anybody else? I'm struggling in my relationship with Jesus. You can put your hands down. I want to tell you something. Jesus died on the cross because he loved you just the way you are. But he loves you too much to leave you in a condition that will send you to hell. He wants to redeem you. He wants to change you. And here's the thing. God finished the work. That's all we have to do is submit to the plan. He will change us. He will put a new heart and a new spirit inside of us that's willing to follow him. Now, does it take work and effort? Absolutely. Jesus said to count the cost. Because it does take some effort. Sometimes it's hard to follow Jesus. Sometimes all hell is breaking loose when you think everything should be going right. Sometimes terrible things are happening in the midst of your life. And you wonder, man, does this Jesus thing even work? But I'm here to tell you this morning, he loves you just the way you are. And he loves you so much that he's willing to partner with you and help you change. Even if you're not good enough right now, none of us are good enough. Can I just get the church to say this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I submit my life to you. I surrender wholly to your plan. I love you. And because I love you, I love your church. I'll be faithful to attend. I'll be faithful to give. I'll be faithful to serve. And I'll support the leaders. Because I love you. And Lord, reveal to me your plan for my life. Thank you for a new heart and for a new spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hug a few necks. Don't forget community groups tonight at the Blair's house, at the Metters house. I tell you what, the Blair's need your prayers. No rhyme intended there. Love to see you tonight. God bless.